My guest for this show is Peter Joseph. He's the creator of the Zeitgeist series of videos, and he has a new book out, The New Human Rights Movement. Uh, it, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate you having me, Rob. You've got some amazing reviews for this book, so I just wanted to mention a few. Uh, Marianne Williamson is a New York Times bestselling author who, who was on this show uh, earlier this year, says that Peter Joseph is one of the great visionaries of our time. If there's a beautiful future, and I think there will be, then his fingerprints will be all over it. And then you got some Amazon reviews. One said, it's the most objective, scientific, humanly, and earthly relevant book of the century. And then another said, this book should be required reading for all school-aged children. So It's very kind that people make those comments. I appreciate that. It, I, I mean, I, almost everybody I interview has a book, and I don't see very many amazing uh, endorsements like that. So, so first thing I want to do is I want to get an idea of uh, you, you, your, one of your claims to fame is that you, your zeitgeist movement is one of the biggest social movements in the world. Uh, yeah. So get, just give us a little background there for people who are not familiar with it, the rare birds, I guess. Uh, oh, sure. Well, it was a very organic development. I think uh, it's you know, something like this has to come on its own. While I might have been considered the founder or the instigator of the movement, uh, as, I, as I loosely proposed it in the second film I made called Zeitgeist Addendum, which addressed a lot of economic issues, uh, very different from the first film. So I, you know, I threw it out there to see you know, what people would do if they were given the option to try and join a larger community to try to see you know, global change as opposed to national change, which is what most movements go for. Because at the end of the day, we really have to have a, a global uh, you know, revolution, so to speak, economically speaking, if we expect to be sustainable in the future as you know, all the pollution, uh, as the pollution crisis uh, continues to grow with climate change and so on, and many other issues that are just as, as detrimental as climate change. But anyway, so this thing happened in about 1990, excuse me, about 2008. And uh, we originally partnered with an organization called the Venus Project, a man named Jock Fresco. And for about two years, we worked together. And then it was decided that they were going to maintain their particular their particular focus, which is more of a think tank, and the movement would spread and do more of the social activism and bridging on its own, and then a natural organic unfolding happened. But long story short, we've conducted well over a thousand events since that time at almost a year, like real physical events, not online events. In terms of our media uh, work, we've done literally thousands and thousands of lectures and online things and so on. So we've been very prolific um, in terms of the movement and the future, well, I always joke that everyone's in the zeitgeist movement, whether they like it or not, because zeitgeist defined as the spirit of the time, we're all contributing to what's happening in this world, again, whether we're conscious of it or not. Even the family with their, their two children that seems locked into a bubble with their nine to five jobs, they're still promoting values that are being shared by others and define the world through a causal systemic chain reaction. What is the zeitgeist movement? What is it? Yes. It's a global sustainability advocacy organization, and we are a 501c3 as well. But beyond that, we advocate uh, a deep economic shift into a kind of resource-based economic model, which basically alludes to the fact, and that's what the bulk of my talks are these days, that the market system of economics, a very old, archaic structure, something we falsely assume is built into our evolutionary psychology in a way that is immutable, as a lot of people have argued, that we have to have a competitive exchange-based society, we bridge specialization of labor, and there's no other option. And of course, many who look at any other kind of social approach, such as what we saw with the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, historical communism, they quickly assume that everything that isn't capitalism will gravitate towards some kind of bureaucratic tyranny and totalitarianism. So we battle a lot of that mythology, because that's exactly what it is. And for, again, for the past decade, all of our uh, events have been centered around the need to educate people and make them realize that we're not going to have a productive future if we don't change our economy. And it doesn't just relate to the, to the ecological crisis, it also relates to public health, which is in part why the New Human Rights Movement focuses so much on public health research to show that it affects a class stratified society, and this is all in our materials as well, a class stratified society is a toxic society. 
there is that is another great mythology that we see where people think well if you have people with more and people with less the people with less will strive to produce and contribute to society and progress it so they can be people with more that's pretty much the basic core academic mythology we've had that justifies class stratification beyond of course the elitist theories which i also cover in the book like uh, a social dominance theory i do a whole section on this this rather uh, ludicrous idea that it's built into our DNA to have a power interest to dominate people. Maybe DNA is the wrong word, but they don't specify exactly what kind of beast within when these theorists put forward. But nevertheless, well, they think- You know, you've, you've kind of transitioned into the book, which is great. Sure, sure. We'll spend most of the interview on that, but I just oh, want yeah, to yeah. get an idea, and you've given it to us, what the Zeitgeist Movement is about. Uh, yep. One last question. Why do you call it the Zeitgeist Movement? Well, because the films I made were called Zeitgeist, and again, when I first thought of a social movement, you have to remember my background wasn't as an activist, really. It was, it was as a as kind of a guy that was working at the time in advertising and marketing. I didn't actually care in the sense that I do now. I didn't feel the oomph, you know. The, I I was just as narrow-minded and narcissistic during the time of. My, the creation of my first film, as I think most people are trying to survive in my mid 20s. So that name simply came out of the films as the experiment unfolded to call it the Zeitgeist Movement, which had, of course, a clinical definition too. I mean, the Zeitgeist Movement being, again, the spirit of the times. Uh, if we want to transition society, we are going to transition our values as well. We're going to transition how we think about each other in the world, and that is the Zeitgeist. So. Okay, so. That, that took care of that. Now, okay. now, how is this book related to your your film series? Well, it kind of isn't. I mean, the film series was a was a strange arc that started off with me addressing very controversial issues in a in a public performance piece, which is what it was. A lot of people don't realize that I was a class. I am a classical musician. I don't do it anymore, and professionally, but that's what my development was: a classical percussionist. Uh, 20th century type of classical percussionist where you use a lot of experimental mixed media and things like that. So the first film was actually a performance piece. And once it gained great popularity, I was like, okay, well, I have people listening to me. This is odd. I mean, that was that piece wasn't even supposed to be released as a film. It wasn't legal. It had no clearance. It was just out there. And some people hated it. Some people loved it. Generally, across the board, all mainstream or any news agencies despised it. It's kind of interesting that it preserved uh, this kind of subculture as it did. And then I felt the need to transition that subculture into something that focused on you know, more relevant issues, not just talk about government corruption and all the, you know, the history uh, that we are familiar with in terms of the, again, the side effects of our social system in effect. You've been brutalized. I mean, uh, I, I, oh, went sure. to, I went to the Wikipedia page for the Zeitgeist <laughs> Movement and... Uh, oh, yeah. And I've had my own share of experiences with Wikipedians who didn't like my perspective, and they literally took down the op-ed news website altogether. And yeah. uh, it took literally two years to work with Wiki with the good guys at Wikipedia, and there are lots of them too, to, to, get, to get it straight. And I thought about you know going in and editing some of what they say about you, but I knew that... J Anything that's in there is probably oh, don't, don't waste your time yeah. because it's a it's a bureau it's a bureaucratic arrogance that exists on Wikipedia as a semi failed type of communal structure, uh, you know, a kind of a collective commons attempt, uh, which I'm in favor of a kind of participatory economic participatory society. But uh, we could talk at length about the flaws of Wikipedia. Okay, yeah, uh, then let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah, sure. You've been, yeah. you've been really slammed. And, and oh, sure. And book, I think, is a, is a, is a kind of a, a, a message that doesn't carry a lot of the stuff that the, the Zeitgeist films carried. That, that sure. I, you know, there's a lot of the Zeitgeist, uh, too, in there, I think. Oh, yeah, there is. Uh, in terms of, uh, you're referring to the book. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, it's a it's a trajectory, and all the stuff about you know economic inequality. I in the third film, which was kind of the masterpiece of that trilogy, because I really figured out what I wanted to communicate after you know a couple of years. That embraces the gesture of the book, uh, but the book goes another length, and it starts to break down you know the very root concepts such as socioeconomic inequality. You know, that's a that's a right, word that not many... back now. I just wanted to clear. Okay. Leave... You know, how it's differentiated from the sure. movement, and we'll get into that. 
I'll say long story short is I've just been in a process of clarifying my position as I learn more and more. And it's been a natural trajectory. And I encourage people to watch the films and realize that there is an arc here and that I think that it's very positive uh, for people to go through that experience to see this new trajectory and how it all fits in in terms of the book. But yeah, let's continue. Great. So what's your big goal for this book? If it's as successful as it could possibly be and beyond, what will happen? Well, successful defined as actually influencing people, uh, that would mean what would happen is we'd see a galvanization. Luckily, a, a new subculture, a protest movement, but more than that, a developmental movement, a creative movement that says we're not going to participate in this system and we're going to develop new systems. We're going to engineer new ways for us to engage our economy and engage our democracy, which kind of proceeds from the economy, I argue. Um, so it's going to, excuse me, in the hope, it's all in the hope to educate and then get people together to effectively change the world. I mean, I can express how that could happen on a number yeah. of different ways. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a long, that's a big conversation, but I can well, sh shorten it. Give it, give it, give, give some bullet points. Well, if you wanted, well, first I'd have to define the kind of economic model that, that I advocate and that we advocate as a movement and, and really has been advocated in part by a lot of people throughout the years that are just using common sense in terms of what it means to be sustainable and what it means to increase public health. Well, let me just throw in one more detail. This is, sure. this is, I call this the bottom up show. I've been doing it for nine years and I believe we're transitioning from a predominantly top-down culture that was set in motion by civilization and we're moving more towards a more bottom-up culture actually returning to the bottom-up culture which is the way humans existed for millions of years when right. they were in, in hunter bands and uh, so I'm always looking for my guests to, to kind of frame some of their ideas in terms of bottom-up and top-down and sure. my oh, yeah. picture bottom up is really big and it certainly includes sustainability uh so if you if you can throw any of that throw that angle in there i'd appreciate it oh absolutely well, i could start by saying in terms of innovation in terms of how we can create a society that has an increased increased justice less oppression we have to develop systems, which we can now through digital technology, that will allow the masses to interact in a way that transcends the corporation and effectively transcends business. Business. Now, that's very bottom up. That's actually returning to a kind of pre-Neolithic revolution worldview, which, of course, was very minimalistic. You had small bands and tribes. They didn't use. They didn't have money. They didn't have markets. And they had an egalitarian system and the you know, existing hunter-gatherer societies, if you can find any of them, there are a few that still remain. There's so much to learn from them and so much to learn from the people that have studied these, these folks, the anthropologists over the course of the you know, 19th, 20th century, where they're mostly documented or well-documented. And I think that in the future, we're going to see a return to this lack, uh, excuse me, this less materialistic society because we're going to begin to understand the nature of our sustainability. We're going to realize that advertising and marketing, part of its job, part of the market system's job in part is to get you to buy things with increased demand. I mean, that's a, that's a, it's almost cliche to say that, but I think people don't realize the magnitude of what that means. You know, we have a whole society driven by consumption. And historically speaking, you know, expressing your point and the kind of the change of things, the early on when the market and capitalist structures were beginning to form, there, there was such an arduous process when it came to creation. And, and we didn't realize that having labor linked to income would eventually manifest over time to being detrimental where we have robotics now that are replacing jobs. And now labor linked to income is forcing people to, forcing, I should say, advertising agencies and marketing to ramp up its influence and to get people to become more and more consumeristic to the great detriment of our ecology. So that kernel seed, and this is, you know, this relates to what you're saying, was always there. And this is what, you know, this is the, the problem of this society is that it's archaic and no one realizes that we're now in an outdated place. And you can't have labor linked to income anymore. Well, you have to have, how is consumerism related to bottom up? Well, if you have, okay, so in a, in a pre-Neolithic society, you have people that had a deep social nature. They actually had a human interest. They had an interest in their society and the community. There was a very playful quality. They didn't have a materialistic re relationship with nature. They had a needs-based relationship with nature and each other. 
And what's happened through time, because of where we ended up after the post-Neolithic, after the Neolithic Revolution, and then upon the Industrial Revolution, where we, where we realized we could produce more than ever before, and then since that trajectory, what I call in the book the Great Divergence from the Malthusian Trap, which we can talk about that, from that trajectory, it had to, we had to develop a society that was based on consumerism. So my point is that you're, you know, what you've stated in terms of bottom-up, there's a value system disorder that's been created that's promoting more elitism. It's promoting more ecological insustainability. And I, I see that connection. So I just wanted to make that point clear because a lot of people, you know, they say to me, well, the, um, the purpose of our society is to, is to meet demand, but they don't realize how much demand we're actually creating because of the need for people to buy and consume. And that translates into all sorts of negative effects, planned obsolescence, nothing lasts anymore. Um, you know, going back to the bottom up issue, since I know you want to speak about that, uh, I, think that I think that in the future, in the vision of the Zeitgeist Movement, is you end up with a very high efficient society where people don't have the stress, or I should say the tradition, of going to a job in the middle of a city and they get in their car along with everybody else and they pile into traffic and then they sit in an office and push paper around and then they come back to their house and they're basically stationary and they're lucky if they go and have a vacation at some point. They're lucky if they have the budget to move around the world. Imagine a new kind of uh, uh, post-Neolithic, well, I'm trying to think of a, a term to phrase this, uh, neo-Neolithic society where you have people that are actually moving around the world with a less materialistic value system, respecting the planet, respecting all the sustainability issues that we need, realizing we can create, create a global abundance on this planet now due to the efficiency of technology, something that Buckminster Fuller, Jacques Fresco, many people have proven over and over again mathematically. And I talk about it, of course, in the book, especially in the appendices regarding the, the abundance potential of all of our food and energy and so on. And you end up with a new society that is very much similar to what the pre-Neolithic revolution reality was, except now it's high tech and now people's home becomes the world. So we're jumping to a big extreme there, but I like planning that. But I like that. I like that. Yeah. I, mean, I asked you to give the big picture what it would look like if your book was a success and you just did it, I think. I, yeah. I, the real core human values are the ones that work. It's not what we idealize in terms of justice. It's what's working. It's not right and wrong. It's what works and what doesn't. And what we know today is that our consumeristic capitalist society isn't working. And it's creating so, so many negative externalities. And when we, when I, I, just to conclude, we follow a train of thought. And that's what the book presents, which is what I mentioned in the book. I say, this is a train of thought, and I, I hope people grasp onto it. And this is where we end up with a very humane perspective, a very ecologically dependent and respectful perspective, not driven by status and consumption and materialism. And we're going to get to your thoughts on economics and economic models, because there is a key part of, of your book and, and your whole message. But yeah. you, you, you talked about values, and values are very interesting to me. Uh, I, I think that there are top-down values and there are bottom-up values. I, when I think of top-down, I think of centralization, of hierarchy, of, of uh, power and domination, power over. I, I, I think of secrecy. Uh -huh. uh, and control, uh, yep. so, and I'm just touching the, the surface of it, but uh, what are your ideas of some basic values that would persevere and that would develop and grow in this future that you envision? I, I think the values that people aspire to, the values that we could say are <laughs> the opposite of what we're seeing with the new uh, uh, iconic Trumpistic world where everyone wants to win, where you talk, you call someone a loser because uh, because they have basically less options than you, which is really what the effect is. Because our system is not equal, it's not even. There's nothing even remotely balanced. Social mobility and all these myths of our society keep communicating to people that it's their fault, but it's not, it's actually structural. So the values that I see are, are really, I mean, I hate to be kind of sound generic, but they're humane values. They're values that probably go back to Native American cultures, First Nations peoples that wrote, you know, that have been written about extensively that saw harmony with nature as actually a success, that saw making sure that their group and tribe and community was actually taken care of as success, as opposed to this, as you just pointed out, elitist values values of winning and domination, 
getting something over on somebody and feeling good about it. You know, these are childish values. And, they're, and again, they're so perfectly exemplified by the cultural climate we've seen emerge with the Trump administration as, a, as an icon as a as a as a as a uh, allowance, so to speak, where people now feel like they can release their childish, racist, bigoted, winning, and and oppressive and uh, and uh, generally restrictive values on each other, and they think that that's actually the way the world's supposed to be. And, and that's you know, I I I think of you know, Trump is is the he's the malignant narcissist of, of the planet. And he's setting, kind of as you said, he's setting up a, a way for pe giving people permission to do that. Yeah. Uh, the person who I think has best e expressed how values are in us is Darsha Narvaez, who did the neurobiology of the development of human morality. Are you familiar with it? I'm not. But... You're gonna move it. You're gonna, you gotta check it out. Okay. And, and what she basically says is that human morals are deeply, evolutionarily wired into who we are and that they came about because of the way we lived in hunter-gatherer bands even before there were tribes okay. uh, that basically people treated each other great and they treated the environment as a part of themselves yeah and uh, that is the beginning I think of, of, a, of a value system that is the kind that I think we want to bring forward. And it's so really, I, I, in one of your interviews, you talked about spiraling back. And that's a concept I love. I think that's the way we function is, is in spirals. And uh, I think that that's what's going to happen is we're, 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 we've begun to spiral back to that aspect of humanity that is, is deep in us and ready to just pop out when this system of economic changes that you're describing takes place. So, so, okay, so you, you mentioned structural system. Uh, talk about that, tie, about, tie that into the terms of economics. Sure, and, and building on what you've just said, without the reinforced operant conditioning, without a structure such as an economy that doesn't motivate people to screw each other over, doesn't motivate trade strategizing dominance, which is a phrase I use a lot, until we can change the motivations of our society, especially in terms of survival, uh, we can't really expect that core, you know, moral kernel to come forward. And that's why I argue in the book that it's really a cultural phenomenon due to structures that we exist in more than a biological one. And I'm not, you know, I'm not disagreeing with you or the author that you quoted, but I think in terms of what will actually generate, you know, a, a humane and peaceful coexistence will come from the structural change, uh, illuminating those elements of our biology, such as even the prefrontal cortex, you know, there's a great general uh, duality with our lower reptilian uh, limbic system and the fight or flight response, the stress response and all the, and all of the chemicals that go through our system when we're stressed. And if you look carefully at our society today, we, everyone's in such a state of scarcity and stress and they're in debt and they're struggling to survive with, you know, 63 Americans, excuse me, 63% of Americans with less than a thousand dollars in savings. That's an incredible position of stress for their future. And that's why I think that they keep reacting in more primitive ways as opposed to a relaxed setting where we're more, pro more prone to uh, ping our prefrontal cortex and the thoughtfulness and our restriction, our sense of restraint and, and so on. So there's definitely a biological level to it, but get into the structuralism. If you read academic work on structural- well, I'll help you out for a second. Sure. In, in, in Zeitgeist, you spent a lot of time talking about epigenetics. And yeah, genetics basically determines whether genes are expressed or repressed. And I think that what we have now is an economic system that represses a lot of the good stuff that we're wired to do. Yeah, and I think what you're describing as in an envisioning is one that will basically uh, unleash and allow those to be bloom again. And yes. they're already there as much as they can be where they haven't been. Uh, destroyed. You know, I used to be involved very much in positive psychology, and I learned that in some cultures, some percent, like, particularly like in, in some Asian cultures, where they encourage repression of expression of emotions, some people, their, their cadavers are found to have, that their smile muscles have massively atrophied. Wow. And I think the wow. same thing can also be the case for some aspects of compassion and empathy, oh, yeah. and caring and environmental consciousness and the sense of we-ness that oh, I think yeah. is so essential to where we need to be going. 
I couldn't agree more. Uh, you, you touch upon a lot of great issues that, that we could expand upon. In the book, for example, I, I talk about these sociological studies, psychological studies that were done on people that get more and more wealth as they age, basically the wealthy. What is their psychology and study compared to the average person? And the more wealth and money and influence that people get, the more apathetic they tend to become, the less they give to charity in percentage terms, the less they can recognize empathic faces of others. They can't relate to people anymore because of this effectively, uh, you know, it's a systemic thing and it's not everyone's vulnerable to it, but on average and statistically, there's a, there's a reason why the Ebenezer Scrooge cliche is what it is. And it's even more terrifying as an aside when you realize that the, the big wigs of, uh, of business are also the big powers, power influences in government, which also begins to explain why, and this is again, going back to a structuralism, why you see such an indifference, why you see the trickle down philosophy, why you see, you know, administrations thinking that if they give all the money to the upper 1%, it's going to go into their big businesses and then it trickles down to more jobs. So the whole thing is structurally elitist. Okay, so let's, let's get into that structuralism. I kind of yeah, digressed sure. and just took yeah. you away from it. What, from what I understand, your, your idea of structuralism, and I, I want you to explain it, but structuralism sets up a way that people grow up and it, it, it develop in a culture so that they just think away. It makes me think, uh, and especially what we were talking before we started recording, it uh, makes me think of um, uh, Skinner's book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, uh, mm -hmm. in which he described how somebody born in a prison would think that living in a prison was freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you, yeah. Well, you, you look at before, sure, there. sure. Well, you look at, for example, uh, I, I've always been fascinated by by uh, terrible anomalies in cultures such as feral children. And you, if you study the the research that's been done on kids that were say locked in a room for ten years, and they don't know anything outside of that room in their development, and they, of course, they've passed. I mean, another kind of structuralism does relate to biology, but we won't go into that one because there is a mesh between the two. For example, if you don't learn language because of your biological structure, if you don't learn language before a certain age, very low odds you're ever going to learn language as an adult. Um, so anyway, but let's, uh, let's step back. So structuralism, and if you read most academic literature, they separate the idea between structural and rational, which is a false duality like most dualities we hear about. Uh, the rational idea is that human beings have free will to an extent that they can transcend the structural influences and incentives and culture effectively that they're in. And that, uh, that, that view is actually still a lot more prevalent than, than you would believe. Um, because when you look at the structural phenomenon, how can we possibly know anything outside of what we've been taught? Every word that comes out of my mouth has been taught. While I might have novel ways of communicating, at least to the appearance of others, the ideas that I'm putting forward are amalgamations of everything I've also been taught. So the structural phenomenon, I, I think Gandhi put it best. There's a guy named Johan Goldtung. He's from the Gandhi Institute. I, I source him in the book. He actually has a lot of great uh, ideas. He's the one that coined the term structural violence, which we can talk about also in a moment. Uh, he does a great job of describing Gandhi's perspective, which you'll find actually carried over into Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, even a lot of the, the civil rights leaders of the time really understood the structures of American society were the, really the, the negative forces that were keeping everything uh, oppressed, especially, say, the Black Power Movement, um, uh, the Black Panthers, and so on, Stokely. Carmichael. Anyway, but so, you know, Johann Goldtung describes Gandhi as a structuralist because Gandhi would always talk about how colonialism was a structure. And you couldn't just put blame on the people that were, you know, agents of the British East India Company beating these serfs, serfs and, and effectively slaves, really, when, when they were taking India over. And they weren't to be blamed holistically. They couldn't just put the blame on them, which stands in direct contrast to you know, the way our legal system works, and the way we, we get so irate with people because of their individual behavior. Because the fact is, it's not their individual behavior. They're, they're appeasing a structure, just like in the military. The military, you have people raised in great church-going families. They have a great moral ethic. They never hurt anything in their life. And then suddenly, because their government says they have to go defend themselves or defend their country. They're put into a rigid structure that trains them very specifically to develop complete apathy for the enemy and complete you know, um, empathy for their group. And then as a group together, they go out and are willing to murder other human beings without even thinking twice about it. And many, in many cases, without even having negative consequences. Now, going back to your moral argument in terms of biology, obviously 
killing people is not natural to the human condition. So I think there's actually good gravity to talk, you know, about the fact that people do have, you know, great stress when they experience that type of thing. But, but that's the structure. The structuralism is dictating what people's behaviors are and incentivizing them. And in terms of economics, that's my big focus, because how can we possibly envision a world that is ecologically sustainable and develops peaceful coexistence deliberately, where people are trying to work together and respect each other when the economic structure rewards the exact opposite? So as I said earlier, you have consumerism. The only thing that keeps our economy going is people increasingly buying and selling. And if they don't, if everyone was satisfied for one day, for, you know, and I'm not talking about food, I'm talking about this constant, you know, buying of gadgets and then the throwaway culture and the planned obsolescence and, and the fact that we don't make things to last anymore. And you can actually go into textbooks in 20th century economic theory where industrialists were talking about, yes, we have to put a expiration date on everything that we make so people will keep buying. Uh, Charles Kettering, you have all of these great industrialists talking about that if, it, if we don't have a consumption society. So what does that mean? It means the structure is, is creating a completely different culture. It has. It's created a completely different culture now that is completely out of line with nature because we can't sustain this type of production and consumption and waste. And and the other, now, the, what is, I, I, one of my favorite people to cite in a conversation like this is Paulo Freire, who wrote a Pedagogy of the, of the Oppressed. Are you familiar with him? I've heard of that text, actually. So, so but basically, read. it's a really simple description of what he has to say. And this is a guy who wrote a book in 1978. He's a Portuguese guy. He was thrown out of Portugal because of his revolutionary ideas. Uh, million sold already. What he said, and, and the title is Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Not exactly a bestseller type title, but what he said <laughs> is that the oppressed and the oppressors are both victims. Yeah. I think they're victims of the structuralism that you're describing. Absolutely. Then he says that the oppressors cannot change things. Only the oppressed can. Yeah. And in, in the model you're describing, who are the oppressed? Well, I'd say the, the, you know, the ultimately, ultimately the lower middle and uh, lower classes, excuse me. You know, 60% of humanity by an ethical poverty line done by Peter Edwards out of Newcastle University puts 60% of humanity in poverty. And it's those that effectively experience the ravages of socioeconomic inequality, which isn't just, you know, a lack of food or lack of resources. It's also the social stress, the psychosocial stress, that when we see people that have more than us, it pollutes our psychology. So that is just as caustic as well because it damages the arteries, it's producing cortisol and all these stress hormones. That's why if you look at the work of say Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett and a lot of other epidemiologists, they talk about how un more, excuse me, the more unequal a society, the more unhealthy it is in terms of life expectancy, uh, math literacy, there's more infant mortality, there's more violence, more homicides, there's lack of trust, there's more obesity. Um, and it's you fascinating to see how detrimental, again, this class social stratification phenomenon is. So it's those in the lower rungs that are the oppressed. It's a gradient, of course, you know, it's, there's no fine line. Because in a lot of ways, the oppressor, if you want to get systems about it, you want to think systemically about it. I love systems. Go for it. Well, we're all the oppressor, though. And I, I don't, because there isn't really that duality. Every time I engage in an act of trade or a, a business, whatever, filmmaking, what have you, I'm participating in the value system. I'm participating in the, in the practice of trade strategizing dominance. And you just amplify that process outward, and suddenly you have big, giant investment banks uh, doing damaging uh, affairs, such as what led to the 2008 you know, housing collapse that led to 46,000 suicides in 60 countries, along with 500,000 that didn't get medical attention, that had cancer, that died prematurely based on statistics of cancer, and a whole spectrum of other disorders that come, that come from this type of indifference. So we're all participating as the oppressor in the indifferent social system. I love that our, concept. And so basically, yeah. as long as you're going along with the system, you're part of the oppression process. Yeah. So, so okay, I'm taking the, the, the bait. You've mentioned trade strategizing dominance at least twice. Yep. What is it? 
Well, if you go back to the Neolithic Revolution, there's some really great anthropologists that, that to, my, uh, to my surprise, as I read about this, really solidify the difference between cultures, really solidify the difference between an egalitarian group that respects nature and that lives in harmony and doesn't have a materialistic bias, which is, of course, geographically determined in a way. I mean, if you're a nomadic hunter-gatherer, you're not going to be lugging a bunch of widgets around because it's going to weigh you down. So there's, there are other reasons, and again, in that structuralism, because you know, geographical determinism is also a structure that developed agrarian society. But anyway, I won't go on those tangents. When you look at, say, um, I think, excuse me, I think it was Tim Ingold who put it best. He said something to the effect, I'm going to have to paraphrase it because I don't have it in front of me, is that you went from group trust in Neolithic, pre-Neolithic society to, to trade uh, dominance and a lack of friendship. For example, first, uh, whatever it's called when people first uh, meet uh, uh, indigenous cultures, a lot of traders in the 20th century, a lot of, excuse me, a lot of explorers, they'd meet an indigenous tribe in the Amazon and they would give, and the Amazonian folks were very kind and they would give them something. And the, and the, and the Westerners, in most cases, they would give them something back. So it's reciprocal. And the, the indigenous tribe was offended by that. Because when you have reciprocal uh, trade, it, re it rejects the idea of the gift giving economic model, which is what Neolithic society had uh, the, before the Neolithic revolution. It was a gift economy. system. Yeah, a gift economy. And when you engage in reciprocal behavior, it's a completely different sense than when you give without the interest in reciprocation, at least not directly, as we know throughout agrarian capitalist, the agrarian capitalist evolution, which is capitalism is directly tied to the geographical determinism of what, we ha what happened in the agrarian uh, revolution with the settlement and so on. So I, I'm sorry I didn't explain this as well as I should have because I don't have the quotes in front of me, but they're really brilliant. But effectively, trade strategizing dominance is the root of everything that people do every time they think about getting, getting up when they go to the grocery store. Everything that they're doing in their self-preservation is a form of trade strategizing, and dominance is the ultimate side effect. So when two businessmen get together, it's not about finding mutual balance and concern. It's about one, making sure they're getting as much as they can at the expense of the other. And if you have leverage, such as say a boss and a person that's just out of college with lots of debt, that's a better example. So the boss can, can lowball their, their wage or salary because the person is so struggling. Uh, we can, it doesn't even have to be someone out of college. It just be somebody that has a lot of debt. Someone has a family member died. Someone has an insurance problem. Someone has all sorts of medical debt. And they are going to be put in a position of subservience to the dominance of others that are going to hire them. So and that's the fabric of our society in, a, in the chain reaction that we see. You know, I talk to a lot of libertarian folks and people that, you know, want to believe this kind of mutual exchange idea. You know, if you're familiar with early, uh, like John Stuart Mill or the utilitarianist philosophies, basically long story short, they look at it all as an abstraction of trade. And it doesn't matter what you're, what you're suffering from. It doesn't matter what has happened in your history or the limitations you have financially. The moment you go into a circumstance to trade, even if you're a prostitute, prostitute selling your body, uh, that act must be of mutual interest. And this is how pathetic and sad our theory of ec economy is in terms of, of human behavior. Rational economic man is considered one that every single trade that exists between two parties must be to the mutual benefit which is partially true, but that doesn't account for the systemic unfolding of all the things that happen that lead to countless levels of abuse and, and all of the uh, dispute and, and general um, inhumanity we see through this system. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm getting a little bit. It not only makes sense, but the other side of it is, is that this gift economy model that you mentioned, which is the way a lot of in, uh, indigenous people function. Yep. It, it's a different system. It's a system yeah that it, it, I think is longer term. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept of systems theory is based on the idea that everything is connected. There are patterns of interaction that are macro and micro. Yep. And so I give a gift to you and you don't give me anything back because there are lots of good reasons for me to give you a gift. And doing good in the world is a gift and it's a part of contributing to that big Gaia system, really. Yeah. That, that is so far away from what I think libertarians tend to think about. And I think they've got a real problem in, in terms of 
of having such a restricted, really very narrow view of, of, of what matters. Absolutely. And it, it really is nonsense. I mean, what, what better way to, you know, going back to the oppressed and the um, oppressor in that dynamic, what better way to condition a culture to think that everything is their fault once again? Because there are structural limitations. If you have a lot of money, you have a very high probability of maintaining more money, maintaining that money and getting more money. Uh, you also have political advantages based on the way this system is organized because big money and business has always, ever since, ever since the neo, post neolithic excuse me, ever since the neolithic, neolithic revolution unfolded, it was all a concentration of wealth and power from that moment on. As, you know, as neuroscientist and anthropologist Robert Sapolsky says, it was the invention of poverty in the post Neolithic revolution. It was the introduction of surplus that inevitably led to the imbalance of surplus, meaning that you had tons of people, excuse me, tons of people with no money and nothing, and then a small select few. And, I, and I'm sorry for this tangent, but there's a guy named Gregory, Gregory Clark. He's an excellent historian. And he talks about what he calls the Malthusian trap. And one great myth that we see in this sort of idea that, you know, uh, trade leads to progress in society, which to some degree it has because that's been the only tool we've been able to rationalize. But one thing that people don't realize is that the, by the 18th century, people were living pretty much in the same, with the same lifespan and the same, um, in fact, probably degraded actually, with the same minimalism and poverty more so actually than they were in the Stone Age. So in other words, there hasn't, there wasn't hardly any progress in the what's called the Malthusian trap from the post-Neolithic revolution excuse me, from the Neolithic Revolution to the 18th century. So if you look at the actual incomes of people, it hadn't changed. Now, what did change was massive stratification with, with a very small group of rich monarchs, and of course, their feudalism and all of that, and then a, just a massive subculture of people that had very little. And very, and, you know, it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that the efficiency sparked. It's called the Great Divergence. And that has been the ticket for us. Okay, now you mentioned out. Great Divergence. First yeah. of all, Exactly what is the Malthusian trap? You've referred to it. But okay, yeah, let me clarify that. Answer. The Malthusian trap is a period since the Neolithic Revolution where incomes and population were linked where you'd have basically, you know, people would produce more, population would increase slightly, but there were limitations to how much income, in other words, how many resources people could take in. It's defined loosely as income in economic terms, but basically resources. It's named after Thomas Malthus, because if you remember Thomas Malthus, he said that poor should die and that we shouldn't care about, you know, we should realize that this is just nature flexing its muscle, that we have to have constant and periodic depopulation. So it's called the Malthusian trap because you have this oscillation between income or resources available and population growth. So population grows up and then people die off. And, it, and that was very consistent and very uh, uh, unfortunate because, you know, it led to a whole lot of, uh, of bad economic theories. And I think the majority of the economic philosophies we see today are still rooted in that philosophy. And then you combine that with social Darwinism and other uh, bastardized concepts because Darwin never promoted some loose arbitrary survival of the fittest. In fact, he, he talks about collaboration constantly because collaboration is an element of our, in, of our fitness. You know, just because someone can be stronger than you doesn't mean that suddenly through evolution, excuse me, suddenly through a, uh, some kind of Darwinian extraction, they should be dominant over you. He talked frequently about that how competition and people working together would increase the evolutionary fitness, probably far greater, in fact, than the com competitive mode would. Where did he? Where did he talk about? Uh, you see it. You see it. Um, you. Um, it was the book that was written after Origin of Species. Um, it's noted in Origin of Species too. Um, you're you're catching me off guard with that one, but there is he mentions competition constantly. The I idea. I remember the book, and I have a copy of it. I should know. But, uh, I know. It's yeah, if you, and other other theorists have talked about this at length too. This yeah. is no, nothing new, but I'm saying, but a lot of people still, unfortunately, out there still kind of gravitated towards this dominance thing, and that you know the weak die, and and the strong and the effectively the rich survive, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So going back to the Malthusian trap, it's just that oscillation, of and it. You could say it's natural because there really wasn't any kind of oomph to our intellectual and uh, technological development until the 18th century, late 18th century, early 19th century upon the Industrial Revolution. And that, if you look at... You call that the Great Divergence. Yeah. And that's effectively, you know, that is really basically the increase in efficiency 
Uh, you see people like Ray Kurzweil talk about that and how we've had this exponential increase in, in efficiency and productivity. Uh, Jeremy Rifkin, another great theorist that talks about the similar phenomenon. Of course, Buckminster Fuller. So again, this is nothing new, but it's very important that historically people understand it, that we're in a different place now. And the ability for us to generate an abundance, to meet human needs, to end poverty, and to get society on a completely different trajectory in terms of how it organizes itself, and in terms of how it, again, aligns with nature, because we have, to, we have to break the link between labor and income, and we have to develop new systems of participatory economics where people can contribute in a way that they never had before, absent corporations, and start to develop effectively a a true democratic participatory economics. I don't even know a better way to say it than that. The, the sad reality is everyone thinks you're talking about communism when you talk about something like that. And that's, historically speaking, there's no relationship whatsoever. You know, I'll just throw this out there for those that, you know, a socialist, uh, they, they hate socialism for whatever nonsense they've, they've uh, been taught in their propaganda. Uh, What's, yeah, exactly. I'm not advocating historical socialism where people sit in the boardroom and plan what the society is going to do. Now we have the ability to create a, a digital network where people can actually work together in a way that controls, quote, the means of production. Socialism is defined in its most principled definition as the public democratic control of the means of production which is really the ideal of any kind of democratic society where you actually participate in what the society is doing. And sadly, there are illusions of democracies, even in America, and you go back to the writings, uh, there's another great book, in fact, I can kind of paraphrase this quote called Business as a System of Power. I've been talking about this a lot recently. I just did a, a talk in Washington, partly on it. It's written in 1943. That was the Convergence it, Conference? Yeah. yeah. How was it? Oh, it was okay. I mean, I was surrounded by a lot of identity politics and people working for, you know, trying to elevate their parties and find new ways to communicate party related themes. Um, and, I, and to me, that is a lost cause at this stage until you get a consensus about what our economy is supposed to be. So I, I was a little bit of a fish out of water there, but Sorry I for the digression. So that's okay. Um, you, you mentioned another concept that I wanted to make sure that we cover before we move on from the, this whole area of structuralism. You talk about, uh, what was it? Structural violence? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so structural violence, again, uh, Johann Goldton coined this. And it, when I first learned about it, I was like, well, that seems like an abstract idea. It's hard to pinpoint. And then the more you learn about it, the more you look at statistics, the more you begin to realize that it is the leading cause of death on this planet more than any dictator or disease has killed an abstraction, I should say, because disease is a part of structural violence. When you look at what's happening, say, in Yemen right now, with hundreds of thousands of children that are sick, you can't separate that phenomenon from the long-term colonialistic oppression and violence that's been generated because in part of U.S. interests, but also other, 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 nation, other nations that have, have worked to uh, destabilize this, this community. But uh, that's, a, that's more of a, a complicated example. Let's step back and just look at poverty. Poverty is really the leading cause of death on this planet. It's a systemic outcome, as we know from the Neolithic Revolution. Poverty did not exist before it. It's a, it's a product of, again, this trade strategizing dominant self-interest, competitive a gaming strategy that is built into capitalism. And poverty, if you look at it, uh, well, actually, let's, let's step back to this study that was done a couple decades ago. In, and people can punch it up. I can't remember the author's names, but it's probably the most definitive study. The Empirical Table of Structural Violence. People can find this. Uh, and it's a study of, of poverty, and it concluded that due to poverty and socioeconomic inequality, things that are preventable, 18 million people die every year. That number is probably kind of low at this stage, given how old uh, that study was done. So that's 18 million people dying unnecessarily of all of the poverty-related illnesses, poverty-related violence that can be attributed, uh, again, to socioeconomic inequality and the class structure of capitalism. So that's uh, you know, a couple holocausts every year. That's, that's uh, more than communism has been purported to kill in the 20th century in six years. 
been, no one talks about this because it's so inconvenient because it's a structural phenomenon. So, you know, you look at the AIDS and tuberculosis epidemics that have existed in Africa and how, say, Western pharmaceutical companies are not willing to let them produce their own generics because of the TRIPS agreement and other, you know, trade agreements that are just completely in the self-interest of the corporations and the pharmaceutical Trips companies. Agreement? What's the TRIPS agreement? That's the agreement a number of years back that had to do with intellectual property. It's, it's uh, intellectual property says it, uh, across borders that you know, you, there's very strict limitations, especially with pharmaceuticals, that you can't just, you know, even if you really need it, you can't produce your own pharmaceuticals without approval. And what effectively happened at this time, you know, when, when this thing was happening in Africa is the pharmaceutical companies, which by the way, <laughs> They spend more money each year on advertising than what would have costed for them to provide to Africa for free what they needed. Uh, they finally uh, allowed them to buy it at a cheaper rate. I mean, this is a big controversy. A lot of people heard about it back then. It went all the way up to the White House. And that's just one more example of the structural violence of the incentive system. And it is the leading cause of death on this planet. Structural violence, inequality generated by our system, both domestically and globally, is the leading cause of death, and no one gives this uh, the, the gravity that's really required. All right, so let's, well, let's do a shift now over sure. to your, your ideal future. Uh, how, does, how does structural violence get dealt with in that? Well, if you realize that structural violence is a result of socioeconomic stratification or socioeconomic inequality, as I put it in the book, then you say to yourself, well, what's causing the socioeconomic inequality? And that's why I argue so vehemently against market capitalism these days, because regardless of its productivity in pockets, it still has that systemic exhaust on the other side. So, you know, you're like a big machine. You've got the production of all the gadgets and widgets on one side. And on the other side, you have all the, the market negative externalities. If people aren't familiar with that term negative externality, it has to do with something that the economy can't recognize. It doesn't know how to solve it directly which is why you have probably more NPOs and NGOs in any time in human history today, because they're the ones struggling to try and fix uh, all the mess that's been created by, by our corporate market driven world. So um, what I believe is that the, the, the part of the problem is that uh, our, the Western culture is built on a, a model that is pre systems. It's built on a Newtonian uh, Cartesian, mechanistic system yeah and th that model doesn't reflect systems uh, systems theory as the replacement for that old scientific model had to be developed because that was the only way you could explain the complex interactions in ecosystems the in in, in biological systems some atomic particles and the the, the, the that allows for these externalities, the other model. It doesn't, yeah. when you're looking at a systemic approach, you have to include that. So it would seem Good to point. me that in, in your future, the one that you're describing, which I love, it's got to have a systemic approach in terms of defining how things are economically assessed. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. That's exactly the problem because the, you know, the, the rational economic man and the, the attempt to make a science out of market economics, which you see all these utilitarian equations and in the early 20th century, the influence of, of this kind of Newtonian uh, clockwork universe was directly hijacked and all of the economists tried to pretend like what they're promoting, uh, which was really just propagandizing markets, attempt to promote that it's a science. And it's not a science because of what you just pointed out. So in terms of think there's rocket science and then there's spear science. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can't, yeah. It, the very the very fact that we have externalities at all that aren't recognized, specifically negative externalities, the very fact that we have poverty, the very fact that we have a complete uh, ecological crisis of the oceans and the atmosphere, all of these things are evidence that the system isn't inclusive enough. It's not systemic enough, and it's what it takes into account. So going back to um, they can, you know, what we need to change at the end of the book, I list um, five basic transitions. You know, there's a chart or a figure that's there. And I'll just kind of run through them. You have, uh, you have the need to, again, break the relationship between labor and income. So uh, I'll be very rapid with this. So you have automation, which is not just, you know, a great thing in terms of producing human labor. The potential of automation as a phenomenon is going to override one of the most 
caustic realities humans have faced since the Neolithic Revolution, and that's the oppression of labor. There's nothing else in human society that takes, that takes priority in terms of social oppression or group versus group oppression than labor oppression, as we've seen through slavery, as we see with 48, uh, 48 million slaves that are in the world today, by UN standards, there are more slaves today than any time in human history because of economic coercion that's happening uh, across border usually. And then, uh, of course, union busting in the 20th century. And, and, and in fact, the entire, you know, at first attempt at some type of new system in the Marxist revolution, that was all based on trying to stop labor exploitation. So I can't emphasize enough the social, uh, re the social uh, necessity, uh, the, the, I can't even think of the right word for it, the, the imperative for us to move to full automation, not just as a side effect, like, oh, let's just automate where we can. Let's focus on it. Where can we automate? So that's the first stage. You get rid of that and you work to automate. And if we had a society that really functioned that way, in other words, if we focused on it, there's, we would reduce 70% of the labor roles that we see today, not to mention that so many of them are pointless anyway. Yeah, Which, no of course, is going to raise the question, what, what are all those people who are at, replaced by the automation going to do? I love that question because, you know, are we, are we that bankrupt in our creativity? You know what I mean? I'm not accusing you of this at all. I'm just saying when I hear people say that, I'm like, do you realize what you're saying? You're saying that you don't even know what you would do if you didn't have an oppressive labor role for your survival. And I, you know, what, what, what will happen ultimately is that there is a lot to do and there's a, tons of human interaction required to develop and to uh, persist with the new system. And people will enjoy doing this interaction because it's mutually beneficial because, you know, they, you know, for example, $162 billion, this is an older statistic, but $162 billion in, in uh, value is generated every year by about 20 million people volunteering for causes related to uh, you know, welfare issues, to poverty. That means that enormous number of Americans, that's just America, by the way, enormous number of Americans like to do things not for money, but because they like the reward of helping people. I think, you know, and I think you share this value. That's really the, that's really the secret. It's, it's helping and sharing and having that sense of satisfaction from of literally realizing that you did something important for you somebody. Know what it makes me think of is uh, I had a conversation with the guy who created holacracy, uh -huh. non-hierarchical management, and it's being used in a billion-dollar company now, Zappos. There are over 500 companies now using it. Yeah. When you when you create a non-hierarchical management structure, you you get the percentage. And I understand it's around 14 or 15 percent of people who leave because they can't handle being given the freedom wow. to take their own responsibility. So yeah. I think part of this oppressive aspect of the structure that we've created is that people's minds are so convolutedly twisted so that they can't even think about it. That's why some people, they retire and they die. Yeah, I think that's I think that's also why a lot of people they come home from work their energy is so drained they just sit and drink and watch football and because they don't they don't their creativeness has been destroyed their their sense of individual autonomy uh, their sense of of general personal interest doesn't exist it's been it's been conditioned out of them I couldn't agree more and that is interesting as a phenomenon I think you there are your next book <laughs> what's that what will people do when they have all that time I yeah mean, a beautiful well, vision that is really needs a lot of investment literally yeah. in money in exploring you know I've been very involved in positive psychology and kind of fleshing out all the different aspects of what's positive in humans and how they work and how it how it happens, and uh, there's so much more that needs to be done. I think I I, I couldn't agree more. The the cultural phenomenon is a whole other level, which is why people, you know, which is why really you couldn't just transpose modern society into this new structure and expect it to work right off the bat. So it takes it takes a transition of values, a transition of culture, a transition of the zeitgeist. Maybe a Moses to will take the people into the wilderness for yeah. generations. <laughs> we might have to be, I mean, there are a certain percentage of people who are not going to be able to handle this change because they're so addicted neurobiologically to the structure that you've been describing. I, I definitely agree with that. I do think that once people see the merit, there will be a good substantial percentage that, that, you know, develop, excuse me, that identify with it because it makes their lives that much easier 
And while I think, in other words, I think there's a smaller percentage that will suffer that statistically. Um, but I mean, obviously we have a long way to go. And the way I argue it, the way I argue it is, you know, when I, when, and I think those are great points that we're talking about. The way I argue it is that if this change happens and people acclimate and, and embrace their adaptive tendency, which is really what humans are, both biologically and mentally, we are there to adapt. That's what we're programmed to do. And if we can't embrace that, uh, then, you know, so be it. I, I, I don't know what else we're going to do in terms of survival because the current trajectories across the board are wholly negative. You know, I don't want to change the subject, but once you have the ecological crisis, something human society hasn't experienced yet, once you have new limitations set on a growing population globally, the blowback of those that are increasingly more deprived is just going to get that much more spectacular. There's a guy, I can't remember his name, he, he developed a theory called the World Vulnerability Thesis. And the basic argument is that as technology develops, you're going to have a, a offensive subcultures like terrorists or so on that are going to be able to have so much destructive capability that there's no way the protective aspects of established society will be able to, to deal with it. And, it, you know, it's not that, that uh, you know, profound of an observation, especially with, you know, biotech and nuclear and nanotech, which makes it that much more dangerous for us to persist with the kind of model that we have. And I firmly, I mean, you go back to every single aberrated subculture, whether it's Islamic terrorism, whether it's inner gang violence, whether it's... Uh, white supremacy. What's that? White supremacy. Oh, white supremacy. All of those, you know, just generally anti-human, group versus group, uh, desperate behaviors come from somewhere, and they almost universally come from deprivation. There's a, there's a man named... Uh, Harvard, excuse me, the, uh, James, Dr. James Gilligan is an excellent psychiatrist for violence. Excuse me, he was a prison psychiatrist, and he's also a violence researcher. He was the former head for the study of violence at Harvard, very much out of fish out of water in terms of elite academia. And he makes the case very, very clear. The root source of violence across the board, even nationalistically, is the degree of imbalance, economic imbalance or inequality in a given perceived society or group, whether it's global you have global conflict. Whether it's domestic in the U.S., you have domestic conflict. So the more inequality you have, the more violence you generate. And the sad part about that is that you develop cultures based on violence now. They're only, their communication is based on violence. So you, you start to move away from the reasons why they were violent to begin with. And that's an unfortunate trajectory uh, because it's going to take that much more work to correct uh, the, the cultural influences that have generated these these hateful patterns. But anyway, you know, I was going through that kind of list, remember? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the next thing is you you have an access society as opposed to this overtly property-based society. And ac this is already happening, by the way. You know, you have, eventually you're going to have uh, sharing car systems that are automated. It, it should be happening right now, but because of legal issues and, and sure lobbying power, you're not having it where people don't need to have cars in cities anymore. They're going to have mass transit on one side. They're going to have automated car systems that they share. And, this, this, the, and that, that's profound. That means an access. That means you're accessing what you need as opposed to buying something, hoarding it. I'm a filmmaker, and I have tons of equipment that I have to invest in because if I was to rent it over and over again, it would be, it would be too expensive based on my use. And, and that's, that's actually working it within capitalism, the, this idea of car sharing and bike sharing. Yeah. There are economic and, models for it's already working. I had Robin Chase on a couple of years ago. She developed Zipcar. Then she moved into another model that was people sharing their own automobile and let, renting it out when they didn't need it. So it's happening. It's really it's, a gradual shift. It's not going to be just a huge leap. Well, it's happening, but it will hit limitations. And that actually, all the things that I speak of in the book are happening, but they're they're going to hit they're hitting walls. They already are. Um, you know, another level of it is open source. You know, open source is beautiful on a couple different levels. If you were to completely remove intellectual property, and you were to allow people access, especially through software design, to begin to create their own products through open source, not just software. I mean, Linux and other examples prove that open source moves faster and is more innovative. And of course, that makes perfect sense. In, instead of competition for labor and competition for resources, people compete for creative ingenu for their creative ingenuity. So if we want to have a positive type of competition, you allow for people to interact in the systems design network. Imagine, uh, like, I don't know if you're familiar with CAD and computer-aided design systems and architecture and, and even engineering. People design cars now in completely virtual environments and can test them. But imagine if you had the wisdom of crowds into that and you had people logging on with a very selective system and they were able to design anything and everything in a group setting 
completely open source. I think we're going to be moving into that kind of a system with, with artificial intelligence too. Uh -huh. And that will be profound as well. Yeah. Once, I mean, in a lot of ways, when you think of design, that's a whole different level. I mean, when you think of what a car is supposed to do, there's no reason for the human brain to have to navigate it anymore because the efficiency potentials, if the AI system is fed with the right information, they will inst the AI system will instantly create the most efficient car possible based on what we understand. And, that will and a lot of AI is based on crowdsourcing. It's based yeah. on analyzing how a lot of people do things. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So that, that's... Moving on, you've got five things, and I want to make sure we get to them. We've only got about uh, five, uh, sure. six minutes left. Yeah, so open source is a, is a giant one. I talk a lot about that, which effectively will lead to the re removal of corporations and the, the removal of effective the business system. And that's, that's a profound state for me in terms of this transition. The next is localization. We've been doing globalization for quite a while with great waste. You know, the, the debate, there's a couple of different statistics, but the average American food plate moves between 1,500 to 3,000 miles before it gets to you. I mean, we still... You know, there are people are growing uh, various levels of agriculture in the U.S., sending them to China to be processed, and then bringing them back. And that's, that's insane in terms of energy usage, not to mention uh, the probability of contamination and so on. So apart from food, food's the biggest one. There should be pure localization in our communities now because that's one of the most important trajectories of technological development called zero marginal cost and more with less, something Jeremy Rifkin talks about, and I'll explain that very briefly. Uh, basically, all of our industries are getting smaller and smaller, and this is really, again, a profound development. So it's not difficult to envision in the near future, especially if we motivated to do this. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. There could be a city center, a production center downtown that's based on effectively additive manufacturing, 3D printers, enormous ones, with people that tap into these systems in design, and we localize all production as opposed to importing things I, from I, I, would, I love that. I, you, you talk about that in, in, I think, Zeitgeist, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. localization. Beautiful sure. illustrations of it. I, I just have a thing with centralization. I think that it doesn't, I wouldn't, it's not centralization. Localization is a better way of doing it. But otherwise, I think it's beautiful. Well, let's think about it this way. I, I get that, that grievance. I mean, first of all, Gandhi talked about the need to disperse industrial centers. Right now, we have one of the most powerful transnational centralizations ever. I mean, most of the food that people eat comes from very few uh, corporate transnational corporations and massive subsidiaries and so on. Yeah. Most of the goods people think are, are individually created are actually heavily monopolized by just a few industries, especially when it comes to distribution. Like, you know, Amazon has 50% of all sales, apparently, from the last statistic I read on the internet, which is insanely monopolistic. Terrifying. Yeah, but, that, but I mean, that's their technological monopoly. I mean, in a lot of ways, and this is, this is an aside, uh, the fact that they can do that with those low costs translates to the fact that it's actually an increased efficiency through their use of automation, which is a good thing. But the fact that they are a commercial entity like Facebook, I mean, that's the danger. So the, I want to make that distinction. The concentration of technological efficiency is where the world needs to go. It needs not necessarily of power, but it's systems thinking, right? So systems have to be merged. And the more merger you get with systems, the more efficient they're going to become. Um, but going back to my point about you know, Gandhi, he talked about the, the need to localize way back then, but at the dawn of the industrial age, and he explicitly points out that it creates independence in community as opposed to centralization on a national or even globalistic level. So you I mentioned zero I would, marginal cost too. I want to make sure you, you get to that, get back to yeah, that. Zero marginal cost is, is, uh, is, uh, is basically the, the process of getting a, okay, so you have a machine and the machine costs $1,000 to make. The very first good that machine makes costs $1,000, all things being equal. We won't consider the inputs, resources of that machine, right? And what the second thing that machine produces would be $500, right? And then every free, everything that that machine produces halves and halves and halves and halves until effectively, if that machine is robust enough, you produce something at effectively zero marginal cost. It has no real value anymore because it's so minimal, you know, like a penny or half a penny. And you see this phenomenon with, say, you know, cell phones, not necessarily the fancy smartphones, but the early cell phones you now get for free because they can be made by a machine in, in you know, about a minute 
and and the technology that goes into it is 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 insanely simple uh, because of the reduction of everything. You know, the biggest, the first computer was you know weighed a ton, many tons actually, and it cost an enormous amount of money, and it used an enormous amount of power. I think in Philadelphia, it would drop and dim the lights of the whole city when they tried to run it. And now our chip in our cell phone is about a thousand times more powerful than that original computer. So everything's getting smaller and smaller. So that, I mean, that builds back into localization, you know, once again. And that's where we're headed if we can get efficient with it and start to integrate and, and combine all of our industries into one. And instead of thinking about it in terms, again, of a concentration of power, remember that this is a network of participatory democracy. Everyone is accessing this system, dictating what it does. And the new algorithms in society, you know, as organized through AI, will allow for such a thing in the same way that people can work to design a specific good or design Linux and so on. That's a giant subject, so I don't want to go on that tangent as far as the actual. I want to make sure you cover the five. You mentioned five. And yeah, so the, and the final one has to do just with the feedback system. We've all heard of the Internet of Things by this point. We, people are connecting to the internet. The internet, in some cities, there's Wi-Fi internet that literally en engulfs the entire city. And what you can do is you can track everything that's happening in terms of economic uh, activity. And that might sound scary to people, you know, in our surveillance society, but this is a very different reason. This isn't about finding out what people are doing to control them or to blackmail them in the future. This is about knowing what we have, what we're doing, and how it relates to the environment. So if you have a dynamic real-time interaction where we understand exactly what is happening economically, where the resources are coming from, how much is left, how much is being used in this sector, how much is being used in this sector, we actually have grounds to measure what we're doing. Today, as odd as it is, there's no measurement whatsoever. There's no measurement of what we're actually doing. We don't even know how much oil we have. We don't know. Get, getting down to the wire, re, repeat yeah. the five different elements that you just ran through. So there's automation. There's, that's the move from human labor direct, tied to income into a fully automated society directly and deliberately with the interest to remove human labor from the economic system. Doesn't mean people don't do things. They would work in design and creative functions. There's access, which, is, which, which negates the overtly property-oriented system. It would change the legal structure tremendously. It would reduce crime when people have access as opposed to the hoarding of property, the theft of property. You can't steal something when you have access to it, or nor would you want to. Uh, it would change the entire uh, phenomenon of crime if you actually had an access-driven society. You have open source as opposed to proprietary knowledge. And we know very clearly that innovation would skyrocket if you got rid of these closed boardrooms and you simply let the public engage. And of course, over time, you know, over the course of a generation of this kind of behavior, people would learn about this. Instead of college or universities or even high school being just about this rudimentary kind of knowledge, people would learn what it means to design and interact. So the skill sets would be expanded. And then you have the fourth one, which is localization, to stop all the inefficient behaviors of globalization and to really create a more uh, a communal focus that, that moves away from large-scale centralized control. And then digitalized network feedback, which again just builds upon the, the phenomenon of the Internet of Things, loosely speaking. And if we do that, we'll actually be able to understand what we're doing with the planet. And right now, again, we, we don't have any of that knowledge. We have to, like an economy in Greek means management of a household. And when you manage your own household, you know what you have. You don't blindly go around consuming things or moving things or throwing things away without taking inventory. And as astounding as it is, we don't have any sense of inventory on this planet because it's all proprietary knowledge. Uh, now, that's a grand type of revision, of course, but that's where the future, the future has to move uh, if we expect to get things on track as a civilization. And we need to wrap it up there. Okay. Thank you for giving us that vision. Thank you for sharing with us so much research and science and knowledge that puts together a rational, sens sensible approach that makes this all seem possible. Not easy, but possible. That, I, I, hope, uh, I hope it comes through, and I hope, again, there's a galvanization, because none, I will just say in conclusion that there's nothing about, while, we, while as you just said, these trajectories are happening, but they're going to hit that wall. And it's going to take a galvanized community to say, we, we need this next step. And, and that kind of grassroots organization is going to have to develop, whether it's the Zeitgeist Movement, whether it's something that transcends it, another kind of Occupy explosion. I don't know. But this type of transition has to be set in motion from the bottom up, no doubt. And uh, that's my hope uh, in talking to you, that people will be inspired to, to start working in that direction.
I've been talking to Peter Joseph. He's the founder of the Zeitgeist Movement, the creator of the Zeitgeist video series, and he's the author of the new book, The New Human Rights Movement, Reinventing the Economy to End Oppression. Thanks so much, Peter. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. Please stay on the line, though, okay? Okay.